see the lecture plan, and we're at the last of this unit on electrodynamics, generation, and um, electricity. I'd like to begin with two quotations to sort of frame how we think about electricity. The first is from Thomas Edison, who said that I shall make electricity so cheap that only the rich can afford to burn candles. And I think this is expressing his wish to improve the quality of life of a large number of people. And as we know today, there's ample lighting, a comfortable temperature, refrigeration, and, and many modern conveniences in this way to see. Uh, the, the other side of consumption, though, is this quotation, which says that conspicuous consumption of valuable goods is a means of reputability for the gentleman of leisure. And this is also a, uh, a, a style of consumption, sort of keeping up with the Joneses. And electricity also falls into this category. So as I talk about how we generate electricity, distribute it, and use it, if you can think about it in terms of these two things as being something that's kind of essential to a comfortable life and then something that's a little bit more conspicuous. So this is the, the third lecture in this unit on electrodynamics and applications to energy. And if you weren't able to make it to the first two lectures, I think that's going to be just fine. I can summarize the, the physics in this, in this one slide. So in the first lecture, I talked about how a current in a magnetic field feels a force, and how uh, if you have a loop carrying a current through a permanent magnetic field, that that loop will feel a torque. So that is, you're converting this current into, uh, into a rotation. So that's, that's a motor. And here's a device which looks very similar, and this is what I talked about last week. In this, you have some external mechanism that turns this loop. And instead of bringing a current through it, you now produce a voltage across the terminals, which you can then use to, say, let a light bulb. And this is Faraday's induction. And recall that in that lecture, we define the magnetic flux as the area times the magnetic field times the cosine of the angle between this circuit's loop and, and the direction of the magnetic field. And in particular, um, Faraday's law states that the induced voltage is the, the time rate of change of that flux, that is, its slope when plotted as a function of time. And so for this generator, you can see this object is rotating, so this cosine is, 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 is rotating through its faces. And that's what produces the, the induced voltage. Excuse me. Yep. The faster it goes, the more voltage is generated. That's correct, yeah. That's the time. So it's easy to take electricity for granted. I've certainly always been able to flip a light switch and control you know, a significant amount of power. But obviously that hasn't always been the case. So I'd like to say a little bit more about some of the history in this lecture. So to do that, let's step back to Paris in 1878. And I also think of the Eiffel Tower as being one of these things which I can't imagine the world without. It's, it's so iconic. Whereas, what is Paris without the Eiffel Tower? But here it is in 1878, half built. It was also around this time that that, uh, that electricity started being a, 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 a used, used publicly. So uh, Senator B. Graham used AC dynamos with the Blaskov arc lamps for the 1878 Paris Expo, along some of the major avenues in Paris. And if you recall from the last lecture, induction was discovered in 1831. And you see now that it's finally being used by 1878. So that's the time that it takes to go from sort of as, as the, as the dignitaries would have said in the last lecture, to the sort of toys in Faraday's laboratory to actual uh, application to the public. So the early uses of electricity were very heterogeneous. Um, there were lots of different voltages. Some were AC, some were DC. Though in the US, the majority of the generation was DC initially. And the first uses were sort of public utilities like uh, street cars, street lamps, and eventually the Edison light bulb, which, which made its way into people's homes. Each of these required a different voltage. So the street cars wanted several hundred volts. The street lamps wanted several thousand volts to generate the arc. The light bulbs wanted 100 volts. And each of these, in these early days, had to have its own generator. And for 
the low voltage consumer, for some reasons I'll talk about in this lecture, that that generator had to be very close to the site of consumption. So if you wanted to have an Edison light bulb in your home, you had to have an Edison generator, say, less than a mile away. So here, this is a picture from Berlin. You can see that these, these arc lamps emit kind of a hideous, intense glow. But these are really the, the predecessors of a lot of the uh, discharge lamps that we use today. You also might not know that we had our own Eiffel Tower in the US, and it was in San Jose. Not exactly the Eiffel Tower, but the idea, was, the idea was that these flood lamps were so bright that you could put them on top of a big tower and light entire city blocks. So, in other industries, there's this notion of selling power. So, there were companies that produced pressurized air, and other companies bought that to operate their machines. And that model was very quickly adopted by electricity producers. So the first company which we would identify as a utility was the California Electric Company, PG&E, which in 1879 sold DC power to street lamps, to, to arc lamps in, in San Francisco. Now as you know, so, so this, was, this was thousands of volts. As you know, the, the voltage in the outlets over here is only, say, 120 volts. So that, that style of utility didn't appear until Edison's Pearl Street Station in New York in 1882, though this was DC instead of AC. And this, this served 85 people, 110 volts, and generated 400 amps overall, and served customers in one mile radius in, in Lower Manhattan. So all I'm going to say about AC and DC in this lecture, but I just wanted to put up this picture to recall the, the distinction. So if you plug an oscilloscope into the outlet over here, you see something like this, where as a function of time, the voltage oscillates between practically plus 170 volts and minus 170 volts. And as I said in last week's lecture, when you look at a power supply like this, it says 120 volts. And that is the average of, that is the square root of the average of the voltage squared, which is called the, the RMS voltage, and that's shown by this green line. Why did we end up with 120? Is that some optimum, kind of optimum, or just tradition? Well, part of it is probably safety and, uh, and tradition in that uh, Edison play bulbs uh, early on preferred. Um, and, and, and DC is, is rather than being the sinusoidal wave, is just this, is this constant. So Tesla was one of the earliest advocates of AC power because of his work on transformers and, and motors and, and, and generators. And he had some people falling out with Edison about this and took his technology to Westinghouse. And this precipitated the war of currents. This war was really quite brutal as industry wars go. And there are stories of, of Edison even traveling around the country, or, or, or Edison's company traveling around the country and electrocuting animals to show the dangers of, of AC. And instead of calling it electrocuted, it, uh, the term that uh, they coined was Westinghouse. Because it, you know, don't want AC in your house because you might get Westinghouse. <laughs> and and it, it is true that AC is more dangerous than DC because there's a sympathetic physiological response to the alternating current that can cause fibrillation and, and death. And that's a risk that we've, we've accepted because of some, some real advantages of, of AC that I'll, that I'll talk about. I was really su surprised to find out, though, that it wasn't until 2007 that ComEd stopped offering DC in its New York area service. And some of these remaining consumers, I think, were not so much that people had DC radios in their home, but that certain buildings had DC elevators, and uh, it was very hard to, to, to sort of weed out that infrastructure. But it, it, it was the case in the end that AC went out, and a lot of physics I'm going to talk about in this lecture is why that why it happened. But DC is still used in some specialized transmission applications, not so much what we, what we not, not the electricity that we get from the utilities, but in, 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 in nationwide transmission. And there are two reasons for that, and they're, and they're somewhat technical, um, so I'm just saying because they're interesting. One is that if you have two AC grids, one may be oscillating this way with one frequency, one phase, and the other may be totally out of phase and have even a different frequency. And what you can 
do is convert from the DC, from the AC on one grid to DC, and then go to DC to AC. And, and that way, you can transmit power between two separately synchronous AC grids. The other reason is that uh, the, these long transmission lines will have some inductance and capacitance. And if you have a very long line transmitting some power, um, that, that can, it, with AC, that can produce some additional impedance. And, and that, and that uh, can compromise the stability of, of the grid. So for, very long, for transmitting a high amount of power for very long distances, it's, it's, it's often preferable to use DC. So uh, decisive moment in this, in, this, in this battle of AC versus DC occurred right here in Hyde Park. In, in fact, at, at Jackson Park at the end of Midway. This was in 1893 at the World's Columbia Exposition. And the uh, organizers of the exposition wanted electricity, because that's, it, the, the, much of the public's early exposure to electricity was at these big exhibitions, expositions. And uh, so General Electric put in a bid backed by Edison and J.P. Morgan for DC. And Westinghouse, who's you know, backed by Tesla technology, put in a bid for AC at a lower cost. And the, the Tesla bid went out. So one of the public's first big exposures to electricity in Chicago was at this exposition where they saw Tesla's AC generators and all, all, all of these, these very AC gadgets, these coils and, and transformers and so on. So this was a big victory for AC. And um, in retaliation, Edison said, fine, you, you can use AC, but you can't use our light bulbs. So the story goes that Westinghouse had very quickly produced its own light bulbs specifically for this. <coughs> so in Gulliver's Travels, the protagonist goes to lots of different kind of crazy lands, in particular these two islands. And on the one island they say, we can only crack our eggs on the small side to, to, to eat them. And if you say otherwise, you're crazy. And on the other island they say, you can only crack eggs on the big side. If you say otherwise, you, you know, I hate you. And they have this bitter rivalry about it. And you might have some inkling that AC versus DC was a similar sort of rivalry, but let me say emphatically that it was it was not. There's some there's some physical reasons, and and, and here they are. So one is dual power. That is that when you transmit power through some transmission line, some of it is dissipated, and the second is the law of induction. So there's really a lot of physics on this slide uh, on that slide. So I want I want to unpack this. So you know that if you have some, some canister of gas at, at high pressure, that it can sit there statically, and the gas inside is also static, but you know that if you put a nozzle and you, and you press it like that, you get a, a spray. And the reason for that is that you have a, a high pressure in here and a, a lower pressure outside. So that there's a pressure difference between the gas, that, between the gas on the two sides of this nozzle. And you also know that if you poke, say, a very big hole in an aerosol can, you get a much greater flow. So it has something to do with, so the rate of the flow has something to do with the resistance to the flow. And this is codified by Brazil's law, where the flow is the difference in pressures across the, the, the object divided by the resistance. So, you know, if you poke a, a pinhole in an aerosol can, there's a very large resistance. So even though there's a large difference in pressure, there can only be a little bit of flow. Whereas if you, have a, if you poke a very large hole in an aerosol can, the resistance is much smaller and you get a much greater flow. So you can think of this, you can think of an electrical system somewhat analogously. And if you recall from the first lecture, the current is the rate the charge flows through a given part of your circuit. And uh, so, so you can picture it, it, it obviously did this flow, and, and this, this I is the current. And it's proportional to the difference in voltage across this resistive element, divided by its, its resistance. So I would claim that based on this analogy, these two pictures are, 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 are almost identical. So in this case, you have some high pressure behind this pipe, and you close the spigot. So, if I, so, you, so you have some difference in pressure here, but R, the resistance from this valve, is effectively infinite, so the 
flow out of speed is zero. And here you have some difference in voltage across the terminals of your your, your plug <coughs> here. But and, and so you have a difference in voltage. But because the resistance of the air is is effectively infinite, the the current that flows between those terminals is is effectively zero. And you also know that if you plug a, a hose in here and open the valve, you can exploit the, the, the pressure of the water. And likewise, if you plug something in, you can exploit the voltage on the, on the outlet. So another way to say this is to move the resistance to the, to the other side. So you have I times R is the difference in voltage. So that is that the drop in voltage is produced by some current flowing through the resistor. And that's, and that's how we think about it. So the, the second thing to note about this, this analogy is that the current is conserved in the same way that the water might be. So if I have a gallon per minute flowing through this branch and these two constrictions, um, it will flow a gallon per minute on the other side unless there's a leak. So if there's some leak here, then you might have less <coughs> water flowing back. But it's, it's just the same with the circuit. That is, if you have some current flowing through the top branch and uh, some resistors, that you have the same current flowing through the bottom branch. So that is, the resistors don't somehow eat the electrons. The, they continue <coughs> to flow through the circuit. But what's happening is that the voltage across these resistors is, is reduced. So, so, so generally, we'll call these things that drop the voltage in a circuit loads. Okay. So that was, that was Ohm's law. And, and now, we'd like to understand how power is dissipated in resistors and circuits. So recall that the voltage from last lecture is the energy available per unit charge to do some work, and that the current is the charge per unit time. So if you multiply those two together, the energy per charge times the charge per time, you get the energy per time. And that's, and that's power. And that's measured in, in watts. So a 60 watt light bulb tells you how much energy it uses in, in an hour. And we write this as the power is equal to the current times the, the drop in voltage. OK, so you can put these together and think about what happens in a light bulb. So here, you plug this into the wall, so you have a difference in voltage between this side and that side. And this, this filament is just some resistor. So there will be a voltage drop across that resistor and some, some current will flow. And so, so the voltage drop and some current flow so that that resistor dissipates some power. And what it means to dissipate power is that it heats up. So that's, that's why the filament glows, because it's, it's, uh, there's some net energy flowing into it. You can use Ohm's law, that is the delta V the, the change in voltage is equal to the current times resistance to write the power totally in terms of the drop in voltage. So this tells you that the power dissipated by your light bulb is voltage squared over voltage resistance. And incidentally, it's not totally obvious why it is if you run a current through a wire, the wire heats up. But then I can, I can say more about this in questions, but it's because there's some net power that flows into lattice vibrations, and that, and that becomes So this is just a, an aside on why you shouldn't use incandescent light bulbs whenever possible. So this shows the intensity of radiation as a function of wavelength. And this blue line is the is approximately the radiation emitted by the sun. And on, on the shorter wavelengths, this is what gives you a sunburn. And on the longer wavelengths, this is what you feel is the, is the heat of the sun. And you'll note that in between those is this visible band. And this is what we see. And I think it's really neat that this band coincides with the maximum intensity of the radiation emitted by the sun. So our, our eyes are attuned to see radiation from a 5,000 Kelvin radiator. So if the sun had been a lot hotter, our eyes, unless there's some physiological limit to this, our eyes would probably be attuned to see uh, shorter wavelengths. So a light bulb is only 3,000 Kelvin, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a cooler emitter than the sun. So its maximum is at the longer wavelength. That's why it looks a little bit warmer than sunlight. But you also know that most of the power that it emits is out here in the IR, where we can't even see it. So, 
So this tells you why a light bulb is wasteful. What you want is something that emits a little top hat of radiation in the visible and nothing outside of it. Because the point of a, a light is to, to illuminate. If you can't see it, it's, uh, it's not being effective. And, and, that, and that's the idea of, of, of compact fluorescent light bulbs and, and LEDs that we're using now. So back, back to the comment again, why, why use AC? Well, in the same way that if you run current through this filament, it heats up and dissipates power. If you transmit power over these, these, these high tension lines, like you might say outside Chicago, again, they, they dissipate power. And if you're a utility company, you want the most possible power from some big generator outside the city to, to reach your consumers in the city. So, so let, let's, let's, let's put some numbers to that. So, suppose that you have a generator at a, at a nuclear plant outside Chicago that can produce 500 megawatts. So, one way to transmit that power is to transmit it with 500 kilovolts and one kiloamp. And recall that the power is the current <coughs> times the voltage. So. 500,000 times 1,000 is 500 billion, that's for 500 megawatts, okay? But that transmission line, th this guy has some, has some resistance, say it's 25 ohms. And if you transmit one kiloamp of current through 25 ohms, you find that there's a voltage drop, that's Ohm's law, of 25 kilovolts. So that by the time the power gets to Chicago, you have 475 kilowatts rather than 500. Now, you have the same amount of current. The electrons haven't gone anywhere, so that's 475 megawatts. So that means that you've lost 25 megawatts of power just in, the, in these transmission lines. So that's a lot of power to dissipate. But it, when you think about that in terms of the total power, that's only 5% of the total that you put, that you put into the line. But now suppose that you, you still have your 500 megawatt generator and you have people in Chicago that want 500 megawatts. But instead of doing, instead of transmitting with 500 kilovolts, you transmit with 125 kilovolts. Well, if you want to transmit the same amount of power, you'll know that this voltage is four times lower than, uh, than this one. So you need to have a current which is four times greater. Okay? Well, you can calculate the dual loss in this line you find that it is 400 megawatts. So wow. 400 megawatts of the 500 megawatts that you put into the transmission is lost. That's 80% of the energy that you generate is just dissipated in, 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 in the transmission line. Excuse me, why 400? Oh, why 400 megawatts? Yes. So if you, so if you take the, uh, so, okay. So to have this voltage, you have to have a current which is four times greater. And the, the voltage drop from Ohm's law is the current times the resistance. So, so, the, so the voltage drop is, is, is four times greater. Um, and then the power dissipated is the voltage drop, which is four times greater, times the current, which is also four times greater. So that the power dissipated is 16 times greater than the previous case. Um, we, we can talk about it afterward uh, and write out some more details. Um, so that means that only 20% of the power reaches the, the customer. So you really see that to transmit a lot of power from, from these utilities to the, to the consumer, you need to use very high voltages. And that's because of Ohm's law and, and, and this dual loss. So, so how high are the voltages that we use to transmit in the US? Well, there are 154,000 miles of AC transmission line that carry 230 kilovolts. And, uh, and, and half of carries other people's, and the other half carry even higher voltages. So, so here's a map from uh, IEEE, and you see that around Chicago, you have a lot of 345 kilovolt transmission line. And these are broken into these, these interconnections, and this eastern interconnection is, is a big synchronous machine. It's all connected. That's been called the largest machine in the world. And you can, I'm sure, see why. So, as I said, there, there are still some niche applications of DC transmission. And here, I call this, it's hard to see it on this uh, picture, but you can see these, these, these lines that go from the Pacific Northwest to the LA Basin. The reason for that is you have a lot of hydroelectric power up here, and you have a lot of people in LA, but not a lot of uh, energy resources. Likewise, up here in the Northern Plains, you 
have a lot of coal, but you don't have a lot of people. And you want to transfer that power over to the northern Midwest, and, and I think some of that must make its way to Chicago. So some of that link is, is, uh, is DC. So you have this, so this is called the DC Pacific Tectonic. One thing that's interesting is that these, these lines are not insulated. They're just, they're steel reinforced, uninsulated aluminum. And that, that's what you see on, on the big transmission towers. So there's a distinction between transmission and distribution. So transmission is sort of interstate, high voltage stuff like this. And distribution is what brings that power to, to buildings and neighborhoods, like this one. And, uh, and, and the length of that of distribution line is roughly six times the length of this transmission line. So there's really a massive amount of infrastructure associated with, uh, with, these, with these systems. Which also say that, uh, so there's this, this idea of the dual loss, but one, one interesting application of superconductors has been that you can replace parts of the transmission, lo transmission grid with these, with these superconductors which have, which, which effectively transmit with, with zero loss or, or, or very little loss taken into account in the refrigeration. Um, and uh, so here's an example of one in Holbrook, Long Island, and it's, it's 600 megawatts, 140 kilovolts, and 2,000 feet. And so far, this has been kind of a niche application for transmission in, in high density urban areas. And uh, here, here are some pictures of, of such those cables. Okay, so you note know that the uh, that if you transmit power with 230 kilovolts, that that's not what we get at the outlets here. And also, if I were to plug something like this into 230 kilovolts, I don't want to think of what would happen. Um, so, so this is this is where transformers and, and, and fundamentally the reason why we have AC uh, into the picture. So, so recall from the first lecture that if you wrap a wire around a piece of metal, you can produce an electromagnet. So if you wrap it around this, this sort of toroid, the flux that's produced by this winding can, can return through that toroid. And you can also wrap a, a secondary winding around that toroid. And this looks just like one of Faraday's induction experiments from the, from the last lecture. We have a primary winding and a secondary winding. Uh, so, so in this case, a changing voltage in the primary induces a changing voltage in the secondary. And in particular, from Faraday's induction equation, you have to have a changing uh, magnetic flux to induce, to induce a voltage in the secondary. So, so this really tells you why you need to have AC. That is, you need to have an alternating uh, voltage to to have this easy way to convert between well, to, easy way to run the transformer. Now, the reason you can use this to convert between voltages is the following. And that's that. As I said in the first lecture, the, the more you wind uh, this core, the stronger the field uh, you produce. And likewise, the more you wind the secondary. You can, you can multiply this induction by that number of windings. So if you count the number of windings on, on this side and that side, you see it's 2 to 1. So what this thing does is it takes 2 volts in to 1 volt out. So in general, the voltage on the secondary relative to the primary coil is the number of windings on the secondary relative to the number of windings on the, on the primary. So you might say that we're getting something for free here. That sounds that sounds kind of kind of neat, right? Because the voltage is the energy available per unit charge. So if you can increase the voltage with one of these devices, are you somehow increasing the, the energy? Well, the, the the trick is that well you might be able to multiply the voltage by some factor of n. You have to divide the current by that same factor of n. So that this this combination, the power the, is the current times the voltage, it, it is constant. That is, if I put, that is, if I put uh, 60 watts on this side of the transformer, I, I get 60 watts out on that side of the transformer. So I'm not, I'm not getting energy for free with such a device. And that, that's assuming these are 100% efficient. But one thing is, what the, the is, is neat and kind of surprising about these, gener about these transformers is that they are 99% efficient, which is very good, but if 
you think about the total amount of power that, say, a whole neighborhood needs, you see that these transformers that step the transmission voltage down to the neighborhood's consumption, you see that they dissipate a lot of power. So, in something, say, this big, you might have to dissipate the power of sort of tens of, of, of hair dryers. Uh, so, it's, it, it's, these, so these things often operate at a, at a high temperature. So, if you've ever seen a toothbrush like this and wondered how it works, okay, let me just say that it charges from this base, and if you take, take it off the base, there are no obvious metal connections. It's not like a, a cell phone charger. And the way this works is that there's a, a, a coil in the base and a coil in the, in the handset, and an alternating current in the, in the primary produces a voltage in the secondary, which charges the, charges the battery. So that way you have this thing which is totally sealed off, but which still uh, can, can, can receive power from the outside. And that, that's just a, another form of transformer. Okay, so let's go back to some of the history we were talking about. So if you want to have something like the model we have today, you need really two things. You need a way to produce a lot of power in, you know, very densely in one location. And, and that was made possible by uh, Charles Parsons generators, such as this one. And here there's a, a steam engine and, the, and the synchronous machine that I talked about last week. So you have a rotor and, and these stator coils. And uh, so that, that's how you produce, say, you know, 500 megawatts in a single location. And then you also need a way to step that voltage up to transmit it with as little loss as possible, and then to step it back down. And then that, that's the transformer I just talked about. And that, that wasn't developed until the 1880s by the Hungarian engineers of Brunowski, Vlad, and Dairy, the CBD closed board transformer. And I, I find it kind of surprising that, that it took this long to produce an industrially scalable transformer because Faraday had transformers more or less in, in the 1830s. Uh, so, so, so it really took, took quite a while for the things in, in the sort of physics labs to be uh, <coughs> practical in, for, for these industrial settings. So this, this was developed further by Tesla, Westinghouse, Stanley, and Cope. And uh, here's, the, here's a picture of the, the patent. So, so that, that's something more like the power or the, the grid that we have today. But uh, one more thing that had to happen was that uh, in the local generators had to pool into these sort of grids. So initially, you might have a generator for a city, but it would only serve some little region. But as electricity became more ubiquitous, it was quickly recognized that, uh, that there, there were benefits to pooling power. And that didn't really happen until 1925 in, in Connecticut. And, uh, the, the, that, and that, that process of, of pooling subsumed uh, all these local networks until you had the big synchronous grids that you're a picture of. <laughs> uh, so what are the advantages of a grid? Well, one is, in, the sort, in that sort of parlance, robustness and n minus one. So that is, if I have 20 generators serving some area, I can design those such that if one of them were to fail, people in that area would continue to have their lights on. The other ones can, could pick up the slack. Whereas if you just have one generator serving an area, well, and one minus one is zero. So if that generator fails, the city goes black. The other advantage is if you serve a larger number of people in a wider cross-section of industry, you have a more predictable demand because you're averaging over all the different fluctuations from individual houses and individual companies and industries. And the more predictable it is, the cheaper it is. So this is one thing that allows our electricity to be as cheap as it is. It also lets you have a diversity of supplies. So you can plug in coal, nuclear, wind, and so on. It's, it's the same hardware. So these are some neat plots from Lawrence Livermore Lab. And uh, I'm sorry, it's hard to read the uh, the uh, the left side here. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so so this shows input. This shows primary fuels and then eventual consumption by sector. So here's, here's petroleum, and you see that that's really where we get most of our, our, our primary energy, and that goes to transportation. And then here's electricity, and you see that it's largely provided, its primary source of energy is coal, followed by uh, nuclear, followed by natural gas, followed by hydroelectric. And what I think is funny about these plots is that you can just read off how efficient this whole machine is. So, uh, so the total amount of energy going to these 
eventual consumers that, that we get in our outlets here is, uh, is 12.7, and that means that only 32% of the primary energy that goes into the generation makes its way to the to the consumer. And there's a similar trend, say, in, in petroleum, that is if you look at the total amount of energy that goes into the actual motion of cars, you find that only 25% of, of the input energy leads to its final motion. And, uh, and there's some fundamental physical reasons for that that uh, will be the subject of the, of the fifth lecture. So that's, that's thermodynamics. Okay. So just to put this in perspective, the total consumption is 100 quads, and the quad is a, a funny unit. It is a quadrillion BTU. Quadrillion is 10 to the 15. And the BTU is the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So 10 to 15 is a, is a very, very large number. It's, it's 100 of those. Also recall that if you think in metric, uh, like I tend to, for these things, uh, that's, that's about a kilojoule. And we call it a joule, it's about like lifting one apple. So this is really a, a remarkable amount of, of energy. So the rule of thumb is that about a third of the power, the primary energy reaches consumers. And uh, the, the loss mechanism that I talked about, that joule loss, is, is something like 7 to 9 percent of, of, of that joule loss. Okay. You can also picture this in terms of the, the CO2. And, uh, and here, all these guys on the top don't produce net CO2, at least once they're operating, it takes to, 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 uh, to produce them. But um, you see that petroleum, uh, through transportation, produces 34% of the output of CO2, whereas uh, coal is the primary culprit in electricity, which produces 41% of, of the CO2 that we, uh, that we emit. And this is, this is 6,000 million metric tons. OK. so. Those were national averages, but the mix in, 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 in some particular region might change quite a bit. So I think in Chicago, we're, we're lucky to have a lot of nuclear generation from the point of view of CO2 emission. And uh, I looked at my ComEd bill, and if, if you're on ComEd, they'll send you a little note about this. You see that 62% of the power is nuclear, 32 is coal, and a little bit of natural gas. In the Pacific Northwest, you might find a lot more uh, hydroelectric, and, uh, but nationwide, most of the electricity is from, from coal, followed by uh, natural gas and then, and then nuclear. So, so that particular mixture changes a lot by region. So the seventh lecture will be about the physics of, of vision, and uh, I thought I would just connect that with, with this lecture by showing a schematic of, of how uh, a common uh, reactor works. So this is called a pressurized water reactor, and you have this this core where the fission takes place, and it 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 it, it, it uh, keeps this it supercheats this water, and then there's a second this heat exchanger that that is used to boil this the secondary loop of water, and the steam turns a, a turbine, and that turns one of the the synchronous machines that I talked about in the in the last lecture, and then and then this this uh, this heat. Is, it, it is, is rejected to a, uh, a cooling tower, one of these very iconic uh, nuclear cooling towers. So, um, coal is the other primary form of generation, and uh, a typical coal plant looks something like this. So, you have coal coming in and pulverize it, mix it with hot air, and, uh, and burn it, and then you use that heat to produce uh, a steam. And typically, these have several different stages. So there's a, a, a high pressure turbine, a high pressure steam turbine, and then there are reheaters and, and uh, a, a secondary turbine, and then, and then even further, a, a, a lower pressure turbine. And eventually, that heat is rejected as it connects out and rejected to a, a big uh, tower like this, or if it's near a river, it can, so that heat can be directed to the river. Uh, so the, the output of the, of the combustion uh, heats the intake air, and it also what, is, is scrubbed and then uh, sends up a, a chimney. So these are just very schematic to give an idea. What is the efficiency of that uh, coal plant to the, from the burning energy to the electricity? Um, so <coughs> I, 
would guess sort of mid to upper 30%. What? Uh, I think it's mid to upper 30%. 30%? Well, 35, probably, maybe as much as 40. Um, Just to summarize the 
physics of this unit, so this includes the, the first three lectures. Uh, so the, the currents and magnetic field, field of force, and uh, currents are the, the classically the origin of the, of the magnetic field. That voltage is the energy per unit charge available in a circuit. And that induction is a particular way that you can produce a voltage, and it's the basis of the, the vast majority of our electrical generation. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's where you find the magnetic flux and the time rate change in the flux at, 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 at how much voltage you produce. And, and, uh, and what you said, I talked about how we need high voltages because of, of Joule laws, that if you transmit power, you, you, you dissipate a lot of it just in the, the, in the conductors. Um, and that the way you do this is by producing it at a low voltage, stepping it up to high voltages with the transformer, and then stepping it back down to the convenient voltages we use as uh, consumers. But the thing, the, the thing I want you to remember in, in this picture or any other thing that we talk about is we start to talk about more, uh, more, more uh, complicated systems is that energy is always conserved. So, so even though it may not be transparent how this power cord is, is transmitting power to, to say at a hand drill or doing some mechanical work, uh, you always have to think that, uh, that, that the power is being transmitted somehow electrically. Sometimes it takes a little bit of thought to, to, to realize how that exchange is actually taking place. But just, just keep track of that it always is. So if I, if I run a drill here, that's taking some electrical work, and that electrical work is being produced by some, mechanic, some big mechanical system outside Chicago. Great, so, so this, this is the plan for the, for, the, for the rest of the lecture, for the rest of the series, and uh, I'm happy to take questions about this lecture. Yeah. I read recently that uh, it's uh, going to be cheaper for utilities to transmit direct current at very high voltages around 50 kV. Yeah, yeah, so I think, uh, so, so one application where that's already been used a lot is in uh, undersea cables. So if you need to transmit power, say from from uh, you know the so Norway to Amsterdam, I think there's an underwater cable. The reason for that is that those cables have a high inductance. So if you have DC, you don't have to worry about that uh, that additional impedance. Um, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and there's some some there's some gain, that is gaining some popularity in terms of yeah. Very long distance, uh, high high power transmission. So if you, if you had say very large wind farms in the central in the plain states, it's a way to get that power. Um, and and I think it becomes cost effective when you go over like 600 miles. It, it's it's uh, or I'm sure that fluctuates, but that's it, it, it's really when you start to think about long distance uh, uh, transmission. In, uh, in the grid, when you have all these generators, uh, different locations for different generators, um, is, is there, and they produce these sine wave uh, voltages, is there any interference in them that have to be coordinated in some way? So that, and, and, and also, is that a similar thing to this three phase motor that you talked about last week? Are there interferences there that have yeah, so one thing that has to be pretty tightly coordinated is the, uh, the frequency. So if you have one generator operating at 59 hertz and the other part of the grid operating at 60 hertz, um, that is a very happy situation. But even if there's an identical frequency, is there still a phase? Yeah, you, you can't have phase differences, and many of the systems are, are set up such that uh, they, uh, such as if, 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 if a given generator is out of phase, there's some net power which puts it, which moves it into phase. So um, there, there's, a, there's a stability position for, um, well, if, if you plug in a generator that's out of phase, it can be such that uh, it feels a net torque which causes it to move back into phase. Um, and, some of the, and, and there are also active uh, control uh, systems that do that. But I'm not an expert on that on details. <laughs> yes. When you start in a generator that is going to be powered into the grid, they have uh, lights, three lights, when it's a big phase, oh. and uh, you accelerate your generator until the three lights are steady. One is brightly lit, the other, but they have to be steady, and then you turn the switch, and you don't worry anymore because they keep, uh, the, your generator 
So it is, it is something to 